Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Steph Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And today, we are thrilled to once again be joined by the fabulous Bridget Todd, co-worker yeah. and friend. Yes, first recording session of the new year. Oh, that's right. Happy first recording of 2022. Yes. 2022. How, how was your, your weirdo Christmas? How was your new year, Bridget? Weirdo Christmas was super fun. Thank you for asking. It involved all the staples I hoped it had. Uh, drunkenness, crazy outfits, yes. fire pits. <laughs> dancing. Um, but then, sadly, right what? after that, I got COVID. <laughs> oh, damn. I know. Oh. So I am recovering from COVID, um, which was not how I planned to spend the latter part of the holiday. So my New Year's was just really spent sweating and moaning. Oh. <laughs> and then, not, not for any kind of fun reason, because I was in <laughs> discomfort. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> that got the turn so quickly. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're okay. How are you feeling today? Much better. I mean, I, unfortunately, I got COVID before I was able to be boosted. And so if anyone is listening and they are like, I'll take in their sweet time to get their booster shot, don't do that. Um, my partner also got COVID and he is, he was boosted and recovered so much quicker than me. So I'm feeling a lot better, but it really does linger. Like, don't let anybody tell you that Omicron is like, oh, it's very mild. Like, that might mean you don't need to go to the hospital, but it definitely like lingers and you feel like garbage for quite a while. Right. I mean, that's the report I've been hearing is like everybody's saying it was a mild case, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're not affected or asymptomatic. Literally, you're just not at the hospital and you may have the 104 fever, uh, all the problems, and it may last longer than the flu. Uh, But yeah, it sounds like being boosted is the way to go. So sorry, Bridget. (laughs) Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it could have been a lot worse and I'm, I'm happy to be on the men. But yeah, it was a good excuse to stay in bed and watch like binge watch shows. So I was happy about that. (laughs) Nice. Well, yeah, it's funny because Samantha and I... It was like right before Omicron, like we, you know, heard about it, but it was before everyone was like, oh my God, it's everywhere. We went to the movies. um, And we saw The Matrix and Spider-Man. We did a double feature. And I... After that, the news came out, everyone had Omicron, and I was convinced I had it, even though I had no proof. Like, there was no symptoms or anything, but I essentially stayed in on New Year's as if I had COVID. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to see anybody. And it was actually very lovely. It was nice. Right. I mean, <laughs> to the point that I think for introverts like myself is now just like, okay, well, I might have COVID, so I, I, can't, I, I can't go. So sorry. <laughs> I might have it. I don't it's know. <laughs> such a good ready-made excuse. Like I might have COVID. I'm worried about COVID. Mm-hmm. Thinking about COVID. Like <laughs> it's such a good excuse to not have to do things you don't really want to do. Yeah. I'm like, this is how I live in my comfy forever. I keep mentioning comfies in our episodes. I know, and they're just not because a I sponsor. Li- <laughs> they are not a sponsor. They need to be a sponsor at this point because I'm always cold. And I'm looking at you, Bridget, because you're actually in sleeveless, and I'm like, oh my god, and it's sunny where you're sitting, as where we are in the darkness and depths of despair. <laughs> apparently, uh, in my comfy, but I'm like, wow, this is a drastic difference between us and you. <laughs> so I am like the other side of the coin, which is that I live in an old apartment and we have old school like radiator heat that we're not really able to control. Right. So oh. it is uncomfortably warm in my apartment. Wow. I actually have the window open, even though there is snow on the ground. Wow. So really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is very, very different. We got like a hint of snow in Atlanta Fairly, and yeah. like cranking up my radiator. I also have a radiator that I is tricky to control, but I think I got it figured out. You open the one in the bathroom halfway and you're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody who has radiator feet, like you have, you have like a weird mechanism of like, yes. you got to do this, got to do that, yes. open a window, like. It's a, it's a delicate art. Yeah, when I first moved in here, I was like, I asked my landlord, what is that? And he looked at me, he said, it's a radiator. You're going to have to figure that out. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh, oh. Wow. Yes, well, okay. Now that we've checked in, Bridget, I am so excited with the topic you brought today because I didn't know this story and it's an amazing story. Um, so can you tell us what we're going to be talking about today? 
Yes, I'm so excited too. Um, you know, one of my favorite things in the world is really talking about overlooked figures in history, the history of technology and the internet, of which there are many. And I feel like they can really tell us a lot about how our identities often determine who gets remembered and who gets overlooked, even when someone is responsible for pretty much changing the world, like the person that we're going to be discussing today, Lynn Conway. Uh, Lynn Conway is an amazing historical figure. She's still alive, uh, but she essentially changed the world. She is the reason why we have things like personal computers, smartphones, tablets, iPads, all of that. And yet her story almost went overlooked because of transphobia. Right, yeah. Um, And it is quite the story and quite the journey um, and still uh, still alive today. So that's awesome. Um, still making changes, also awesome. But can we get into some of the early history here? Yes. So Lynn Conway, she was born in 1938 and was assigned male at birth. But from an early age, she knew there was more to her story as it pertained to her gender. Um, her mom was studying anthropology at Columbia and she would flip through her mom's school textbook, sort of looking for any kind of answers or perspectives that spoke to how she knew she was feeling. Um, and there's a really lovely profile of Lynn Conway in uh, Michigan Engineering News. Uh, so definitely check that out. But in that profile, she says, it seemed like people in other cultures had found different ways to deal with what I knew I was feeling. But then that became scrambled with the thought that what I was feeling was that I was gay. But no one ever talked about these things. Um, when Conway was 14, she read a news story about the former Army private Christine Jorgensen, who was the first person in the United States to publicly announce a gender transition. And that really changed everything for Lynn Conway. She said from reading that story, she knew what she needed to do. Like, she realized, I, like, I am going through the same thing and this is what I want to do. And it really set her out on this journey to discover her identity. Right. Wow. I, I really couldn't imagine in that date and time being in that place. Like, it is difficult as it is today in 2022. Oh, my God, I just said the year. 2022 <laughs> of being a part of the queer community in general. Even no matter what, I just, you know, not to put too much of my personal life out there, I, I just had a big discussion with my parents about acceptance of the queer community. Point blank. Not not anything outside of not me coming out. No, just just what it was. And it was a little bit combative from my parents, that just them tr trying to accept the queer community in general and talking about what that is in relation to their conservative ideas. So I can't imagine, if those are the hard conversations we're having today, I can't imagine what it would have been like back then. So what was her coming of age story like? Or what, what was it that we need to know about because I can't, again, like my heart just like is pounding <laughs> at the idea of what she went through. Yeah, it's a, that's such a good point. And when I was putting together this outline of her, of her life, that was something that I kept getting struck by, the ways in which we have come so far as a society in terms of accepting, but also the ways in which we have a lot further to go as in terms of sort of accepting and supporting uh, folks who are on a journey, right? And so um, Conway initially tried to transition while she was studying at MIT in the 50s. And so she basically started taking hormones that she had procured on her own. And then she talked to a friend who was in medical school to see if he could help her connect to a doctor who might be able to help her. And this friend ended up taking her to a dean at the college. And that dean told her that she did not stop taking these hormones on her own, that she would end up at a mental institution. And this fear of being institutionalized and also arrested is something that really marked Lynn Conway's life. You know, back then, you know, if you were, if you were to, you know, transition or come out as trans, in a lot of places you could just be outright arrested, but also the threat of being institutionalized in a mental institution. And you know, I, I it's, again, it's one of those things that it makes me so sad that even today there are people that equate being trans with being mentally ill or being a criminal. Like, it's, it's one of those things that obviously it was so salient to Lynn Conway back in the 50s, but it's not like we've, unfortunately, it's not like we have completely moved beyond that because there are certainly still people out there today who believe, oh, if you're trans, you belong in a prison, you belong in an institution, you know, you're, you're not, quote unquote, normal. And yeah, it just is one of those ways that makes me, on the one hand, marvel at how far we've come, but also lament that we have so much further to go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, just all of the laws we've seen passed, the anti-trans laws, it's just ongoing and it's this constant onslaught 
And, you know, it's targeting, in a lot of cases, cases young young children, like people in, in schools, and it's so damaging and so toxic. And I can imagine for Conway, this, that fear and being told by the dean, like th- this was a legitimate fear, was a huge setback. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Lynn Conway talks about her time at MIT as like, fairly traumatic. After this really disappointing turn of events, when she was trying to transition initially, she kind of just put transitioning at the back of her mind. She got married. She became a parent. She started working at IBM. Um, At this time in Lynn's life, she, from the outside, seemed to kind of have a picture-perfect life. Um, She was making major moves and innovations at IBM, which at the time was the seventh largest corporation in the whole world. And while she was working at IBM, by all accounts, she was kicking ass. You know, she invented a hardware protocol that enabled the out-of-order command processing most computers still rely on today. Um, But all of this, all of these accomplishments and all of this, like, fantastic domestic life that that she seemed to be living was put into jeopardy because of transphobia. And that transphobia would really alter the trajectory of her life. I can't imagine a person who has that much stress on in their lives and that much conflict being able to like, what would she have really accomplished if she was able to be fully accepted as who she was at that point in time? And, you know, and the other thought is, like, her friend really betrayed her. I can't imagine uh, try to, ever coming out again or even questioning again or even saying anything out loud because the person that she trusted literally ratted her out in order to have this agenda pushed against her saying, nah, you better stay in the norm a.k.a. what we think is normal, or you are going to be criminalized, essentially, for who you are. And I'm just like, ah! <laughs> Everything, ah! Yeah, that's something that I think about a lot when it, when it comes to things like transphobia. You know, how much brilliance does the world miss out on because of transphobia? Lynn Conway accomplished a lot, but could she have accomplished so much more if she wasn't putting up with this? And so I think about trans folks today, you know, the kinds of, like, ridiculous legislation that they have to spend their time combating, the kinds of ridiculous myths and stereotypes and and misinformation about who they are and their identities, if they didn't have to spend their time countering that kind of nonsense, what could they be accomplishing? And so I always wonder, not only is it completely unfair and unacceptable that trans folks have to put up with that, but we all miss out. Like, we all miss out on contributions that could make our lives better or more interesting or more creative when marginalized people are saddled with these kinds of, you know, this kind of nonsense, like an onslaught of laws and misinformation about who they are. Right, yeah. Um, (laughs) I feel like that we talk about that a lot on here and all the things that, you know, the stories that aren't even being told. And then that impacts what people think or who people think are doing in technology or STEM field in general, um, who are making these, these big moves and, you know, still using this technology. That's, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know about her. And all Conway, even though she kind of put this transitioning on the back burner and never really left her mind, right? That's right. So eventually she learned about the pioneering gender transition work of Dr. Harry Benjamin. Um, He was a famous endocrinologist and sexologist who was really known for his clinical work with trans folks. And she decided, I want to work with this doctor. This is the doctor who is going to help me. And this is something that I find so heartbreaking that was in that Michigan engineering uh, profile I mentioned earlier. It sounds like Conway and her then spouse had really worked out like a solid plan of the logistics of how this transition was going to work for their family. They decided they were going to get a divorce and that Conway would start working with Dr. Benjamin to transition and that she was going to pay child support from this IBM salary that she'd had. And they decided that she was going to stay in the lives of their children and that the children would call her aunt, right? And so it sounds like as a family unit, they had really ironed out how this was going to work. And according to another really compelling uh, piece I read in Forbes by Jeremy Alessandre, 
Conway's immediate family and IBM, like her coworkers at IBM, were actually pretty accepting and supportive of her desire to transition at first. Like, even though this was, you know, the 50s, the 60s, like, they were kind of okay with it and, like, were supporting this choice. However, when IBM's corporate medical director learned that Conway was planning to transition in 1968, he told CEO Thomas J. Watson Jr., who fired Conway to avoid the public embarrassment of employing a trans woman. And so all of this work that, that Conway had done with uh, her then spouse to, to, to iron out the logistics of how this was going to work, you know, was basically pulled from under her. And this really, like, it, it sounds like this was like a completely destabilizing thing in her life. Oh, God. I mean, yeah, absolutely. If you think you have a plan and you're excited about at least having um, forward steps and then having something that is so traumatic that once again is betraying you, essentially, something that you are so excited about and not even excited about, just trying to live your life as you truly are. I can't imagine how this would have just deflated you. I've I've been without a job. I've been fired. And that sense of self is gone and self-worth feels like you're, it's just a loss of yourself. So someone who can't even express themselves, losing even more of themselves, holy crap. And I can't, on top of that, like this, again, y'all, my, my Christmas was a doozy. But this again kind of goes back to my conversation with my parents of like, this is why these laws are important. This is why anti-discrimination laws need to be in place. And when we talk about tugging at the strings, which is what is happening under the Supreme Court, which is what we're talking about every day still, um, these are things like this can happen. And it truly, it, I can't imagine what the impact was for her to be fired during the middle of a thing that she thought she could maybe finally find herself. Yeah, it's so sad. It really seems like it started like a downward spiral in her life. You know, she had to divorce her spouse while losing her sole source of income, which, you know, obviously, as you just described, like, makes it that much more difficult when you, your source of income is gone, your identity that was attached to having this, like, pretty big deal job being, not just being taken from you in this way, but, like, your contributions, you know, she was someone who kicked ass, who really made a lot of contributions. And being fired like this, like meeting those contributions and all of that work just sort of going overlooked because of transphobia. And so it really sounds like this, like, was a really dark time for her. The California Social Services tried to keep her away from her kids. And Conway's then ex-spouse decided that she could not have any contact with them because she was worried that if Conway was in her kid's life, that they would be taken by the state. And at the time, her kids were just babies. They were two and four years old. And this sounds like something that really stuck with Conway. In this profile, she recalls, that tore me up, let me tell you. The hardest part about the whole thing was that I really felt like a mom to them. And again, just what a domino effect, a negative domino effect, being fired for being trans caused in her life, losing her income, losing that identity, breaking up her family. And she, you know, she knew this was going to be a really tough process. And she relied on her lessons that she had learned from this, like, lifetime love of outdoor adventures, like canoeing and rock climbing, to steady herself. She described it. Now I had a plan to get across the river, she said. I could see the steps I had to make. I could see the dangers and how to protect against them. The only problem was I didn't know where I'd end up on the other side. So even though this had cost her her job, her family, her domestic life, she still continued to work with Dr. Benjamin to transition. Right. And there were so many, as that quote described, challenges and obstacles beyond what we've already talked about, which is already a lot. <laughs> um, so, 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 so much. Um, so can you talk about some of the challenges that were that Conway faced around this transition? Absolutely. So as a lot of trans folks will probably tell you, some of the logistics around transition, you know, things like changing your name, getting new identification and paperwork, can be a big part of navigating trans identity so that you can work and earn an income and have a bank account and get a place to live. Uh, even today, this process is really complicated and sometimes like prohibitively expensive. Uh, and again, I'm sad to say that not a lot, you know, it was hard back then and unfortunately it's, it's hard today. Unfortunately, a lot of trans folks don't have the support or resources they need to navigate it. According to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, only one-fifth of trans people who have transitioned have been able to update all of their IDs and records with their new gender, and one-third have not been able to update any of their IDs or records. 
Um, luckily for Conway, she was able to use connections that Dr. Benjamin had in Oakland, California, to get it done quickly, which, as you might imagine, was really, really important to avoid suspicion back then because, you know, it could easily turn unsafe if somebody suspected, you know, that you were transitioning or that you were trans. And so being able to navigate this quickly was of the utmost importance for her. She has this quote, she says, you were an undocumented alien from Mars. You don't have a birth certificate. How are you going to get a job? This was the 60s. You could think of it like being a spy in a foreign country. If you were found out, you'd be dealt with immediately. If not by the police, then by people on the streets. Um, and so it's probably clear that why, after actually going through this transition, Conway started the period of her life, which she refers to as her the stealth phase of her career. Okay, so this entire thing feels like it should be a giant movie, right? It should be yes. a feature movie somehow, whether it's like uh, coming of age and or just overall like, yeah, it could be like a spy movie in the industry, but it's not. I'm, not, I'm just saying that from her quote in itself, but it's an amazing account of all of the things that she has gone through. I feel like, hello, actors, this is an Oscar <laughs> yes. level of performance if you can get it, and it should be done by a trans woman, obviously. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> can you talk like, about this? I would this? watch this. <laughs> I, right, I want to see this. Can you talk about the stealth phase? Because, yeah, I'm really into the movie now. Yes, so in 1969, uh, Conway changed her name hid her gender identity, and started looking for uh, work in computing. Eventually, she found a job as a contract programmer, which is, like, pretty entry-level. But because she is, a, a, like, a badass, she pretty quickly moved up. She later worked at Memorex and then landed what I'm calling the big account. Like, you know in movies when someone's like, oh, we got the big account. Yeah. <laughs> like, this was Conway's, like, her big account. Working at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, which is a huge, huge deal. And again, because she is a badass, she immediately started like kicking ass just like she had before at IBM before getting fired. So is that at Silicon City? Am I, am I, am I making that uh, up? Is that the beginning yeah. of I that think, area? I think, yeah. I think that's like the, like the Silicon Valley area. Yeah, right. like that was like Stanford. where so many of the technological innovations that like st we still have today that really shaped like where computers and technology and smartphones ended up going, so much of that research happened right there. So, like, right. the big account. So she <laughs> literally was at the beginning of what is known as one of the biggest technological industrial times of our age. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like, that alone, even if, like, like, I find her story so fascinating and, and inspiring, but, like, that alone is a huge deal, right? Like, we haven't even gotten into some of the other parts of her life, but that alone, being a trans woman at the forefront and the precipice of all of these things that would go on to revolutionize all of our lives is so interesting to me. Like, that alone would be a huge accomplishment. Yes, and speaking of, there were many other accomplishments that she she was in, taking part in uh, during this time, right? That's right. So I have to give a little bit of a caveat that, like, I am not an engineer, so engineers who are listening, don't come after me if I say the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm I'm summarizing. <laughs> I am a I am a non hard tech person summarizing someone who was like one of the most brilliant tech minds <laughs> on the planet. So so give me so. Just know that. Yeah. So her work completely revolutionized how microchips were designed. And she's sometimes called the hidden hand, like that's her nickname, uh, for this work and how it led to the tech revolution in the 80s and 90s. And again, it's like a big part of the reason why we have smartphones and personal computers. But even while she was accomplishing all of these important innovations, she really couldn't own them because of her identity. Again, she says that she was working in sort of stealth mode where she was just kind of purposely staying behind the scenes despite creating these innovations that would literally go on to change the world. Um, and during this time, her trans identity was not public knowledge. She only told close friends or, like, HR people or people who were needed to, like, do her security clearance. And she purposely made herself scarce and stayed behind the scenes, you know, hence the nickname The Hidden Hand. But that meant all of her accomplishments and innovations, they also stayed behind the scenes, too. And, you know, it's one of those things where this is not, like— you know how people are like, oh, women's history is all of our history, or black history is all of our history, or trans history is all of our history. This is, you know, everybody uses a computer or a smartphone for the most part, and like transphobia almost kept us from having a full accounting of this history that shaped all of our lives, right? Like Lynn Conway touched, all, like her work touched all of us, and we almost did not get a full accounting of it because of the harmful legacy of transphobia and transphobic systems.
Wait, can we first say that The Hidden Hand is the title of the movie, right? That's, <laughs> yes. that's oh, it, yes. right? <laughs> if there are any, like, movie execs listening, like, <laughs> The Hidden Hand, perfect. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe I've been watching way too many martial arts films, but I'm like, wait, wait, wait. This is, like, Asian level of martial arts <laughs> Stealth yes. movie. I don't know what's happening, but I'm seeing it. Maybe it just needs to be transformed to, into that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you. I, I hate that this is, once again, when we talk about women in history, especially uh, women in marginalized communities, how they literally have to shrink in order to accomplish what they have to do, quote unquote, to live what they need to do and be who they need to be, to shrink and disappear into the background so they don't make too much noise. And that is what has been taught for so long. And this is one of the prime examples for so many, especially, again, within the queer community, yeah, within like uh, women of color, especially black women being told, yeah, you can do it, but you don't be loud about it because then you're just going to cause too much of a ruckus and your personal life, you just being you will be a distraction. And I'm enraged right now just thinking about it as I continue on because this is such uh, a pattern with our society and the misogynistic idea overall that this is how it should have been. And this is how everybody accepted it and was okay with it. And I'm reading all the things that you put in here and I'm like, wow, wow, wow. Like how... How do you keep going? How do you continue to persevere and create these amazing things when there's so much against you, when you're being continually told, don't exist, point yeah. blank? I mean, I, 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 it's, it's enraging. And it's like, you know, you were talking about these conversations you were having over the holidays with your family. I think for a lot of people, it's exactly what you said. It's, I don't hate queer people. I don't hate trans people. I just don't want to... I don't want to think of, have to think about them. I don't want them to take up too much space. Like, this idea that, you know, I, I remember having similar conversations with my family where they would be like, well, I just don't want it shoved in my face. And right. it's like, n- I, it, no one's shoving it in, like, sh- like for, for some people, just existing is shoving it in your face, right? right? Just, like, taking up space and being yourself is equated with, like, quote, shoving it in someone's face. And so I, I agree. I think that it's such a pattern where women, queer folks, trans folks— Black folks, folks of color, the only way that we're told that we can safely exist is if we shrink ourselves and sort of try to disappear and and try to stay off the radar. And it breaks my heart that that's what Lynn Conway had to do. But again, what could we, what kind of world could we live in if all these folks didn't feel like that's what they had to do just to exist? Right. I mean, literally to be able to say, I'm here and this is who I am end of story. And she's not asking for recognition. She never was. She just wanted to be. And I think that's where I I want to throw things, throw things at lots of people, especially, obviously, the people who are uh, ignorant and are continue to spread these types of hate and this type of uh, environment saying that the only way that we are happy is if my norm from way back when, which is uh, steeped in misogyny, steeped in patriarchy, uh, steeped in racism, that if this exists, then I'm okay. As long as you don't, you you don't exist in my world, and I don't have to think about you. And that's just a whole other level. But you know what? If this is the movie, I feel like this is the arc where she becomes triumphant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is where I think it gets so interesting. So. Basically, Conway had made all of these big contributions, not just during her time at Xerox, but also going back to 1968 when she was still at IBM. And, you know, at this point, none of these contributions were really attributed to her. In 1999, a computer historian began investigating her early innovations at IBM, which tipped her off that other people had been taking credit or had been, like, kind of sort of low-key taking credit for the work at IBM that she had done under a different name. She wanted to correct the record, But in order to do so, she knew that she would need to open up about her identity and explain why somebody with a different name had made all of these big contributions and accomplishments that she was saying actually belonged to her. And so she ended up telling this computer historian and then quietly added a, quote, gender transition section to her own website. And this small, quiet decision is what really sparked the next chapter of her life as this, you know, outspoken advocate for trans rights. And what an interesting conundrum that would be to say like, well, I want to correct the record. I want people to know that that this was me, that I did this work. But in order to do that, I really have to, you know, 
open up about my identity in a way that I haven't really been so comfortable with before. And so how interesting it is that that personal choice and that personal, you know, conundrum for uh, Lynn Conway would go on to broaden all of our understanding of our world and all of our understanding of like why we have the technology that we do and who is responsible for it. And so I just always thought that was an interesting way that like this personal dilemma for Conway had these massive global implications for all of us and our understanding of technology and the internet and history. Right, yeah. It's one of those things where for for some people that would be such a like minor thing, but to that's huge to have to make that decision and to also like weigh the implications of your personal life on something that again for a lot of people might be pretty minor, but this is it changes Lynn Conway's life and it changes all of ours and all of the the understanding and information we have about things we do use all of the time and who's behind those and who's responsible for those. And yeah, it's not an easy thing to do at all. But also, yeah, this really led her down this path of advocating for trans rights, right? Absolutely. So the list of all the different ways that she became this outspoken advocate for trans rights is very, very long. She's given support and assistance to many trans women who were going through transition. And she was an advocate for employment protections for trans folks. And then also just a general advocate for trans folks in technology. Um, One of my favorite things about her that she has done is that in 2013, Conway and Leandra Vicky of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, successfully lobbied the board of directors of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, which is essentially a code of ethics uh, pertaining to the engineering profession, to include trans identity, which impacts, you know, the largest engineering professional society today. And so that's going to have, like, global, far-reaching impacts to make that trans inclusive. And so that was work that she was able to do because she had become this, like, outspoken advocate for trans rights. And then, like, Yeah, just, you know, I'm so happy that she had this time in her life where she was able to be a vocal advocate for her people and make make change for other people coming up in technology. Like, I think that's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, (laughs) and I got to ask, did did IBM ever, you know, (laughs) come back with the apology? Well, so that's a great question. So you're probably thinking, wow, Conway is basically this like world-changing badass who is the reason we have smartphones. IBM really messed up by firing her. And they would agree after over 50 years of silence about how they treated Lynn Conway. Finally, in October of 2020, IBM invited their staff to an event called Tech Trailblazers and transgender pioneer Lynn Conway in conversation with Diane Gerson. And Gerson at the time was IBM's senior vice president of human resources. And the event started with a formal apology to Conway for her transphobic firing 52 years earlier. And Conway said that when this was happening, she was like struggling to hold back tears. And not only did they apologize, but they also recognized her immense and deep contributions to IBM's work that, again, had just gone like unattributed because they fired her. So they fired her to avoid being associated with a trans woman. And so they couldn't very well be like, oh, well, all of these different things, we are contributions we have because of this trans woman we fired for being trans. So they they basically just like overlooked and unattributed all of this work that she had done. Dario Gill, director of IBM Research, presented Conway with a Lifetime Achievement Award given to individuals who have changed the world through technological innovations. And Gill noted that Lynn's extraordinary technical achievements helped define the modern computing industry. She paved the way for how we design and make computing chips today and forever change microelectronics, devices, and people's lives. And again, you know, it was 52 years later that this company finally acknowledged that after she was fired in 1968, that her research was still aiding IBM's success today. A spokesperson for IBM said in 1965, Lynn created the architectural level advanced computing system one simulator and invented a method that led to the development of a superscalar computer. This dynamic instruction scheduling invention was later used in computer chips, greatly improving their performance. Um, And so basically, all of that is to say, finally, IBM was like, oh, yeah, this like groundbreaking research that she did, we still use today and like actually really helped us today. And, you know, it just for me is like, Finally, 52 years later, you can apologize and acknowledge. And Conway said of the event, instead of just being a resolution of what happened in 1968, 
it became a heartfelt group celebration of how far we've all come since then. Wait, so did the dude that fired her, was he still alive? Because I just really need to know that he needs to know <laughs> that great they apologize. Well, I that's really a great need question. to see this. Like, I want him <laughs> sitting in the board meeting, hearing this conversation, and them saying, you know what? This is your fault. You messed up, and we're having to do this to do a mea culpa because of right, what you like- did. I really need that in the back of yeah. my head. I want a, per- if, if he, I don't know if he's still alive, but if you're, if he is, I want a personalized video message of apology. <laughs> I need this. This is what I need. And you know what? Because uh, I feel like, again, this is a movie in my head that I've been playing for the last 30 and what, 30 somewhat <laughs> minutes. I need to know, I need to see the scene of her standing by the river with her <laughs> nice home, talking about her past, sitting with hopefully her children and her grandchildren, and just talking about where she is today. So can you please finish out this conclusion that I desperately need? (laughs) Oh my God, I'm happy to. And this is something else that I like love about her story is that she's still very much alive. January 2nd, she celebrated her 85th birthday. So just a few weeks ago, happy birthday. Happy birthday. birthday. (laughs) And something else that I love about her story is that like she... You know, when I was researching for this episode, I found all these great videos of her. She is living her best life. Yes. She lives on 24 beautiful acres of meadow, marsh, and woodlands in rural Michigan with her husband, where they spend all of their time, like, exploring the outdoors. You know, in I saw these videos of them riding, like, four-wheelers together on their property and, like, canoeing together and, like, climbing together. And I just thought, like, I'm so happy that she is, like, living her best life. And she's still an amazing activist. You can follow her on Twitter, at Lynn Conway. And, yeah, I just am so happy that her story ends with her, with a loving husband, living her best life in Michigan, exploring the outdoors. Yes, and I love that this theme of, like, adventure and canoeing has been so foundational and helped her through these, like, tough times in her life. And now she has all this land and she gets to still explore those things that bring her joy. That makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, it's really sweet. Like, if anybody, like, definitely, go- like, you can Google pictures of her and Google videos of her on her property. And, like, it's it's the cutest. It, like, melted my heart. It made me very, very happy. Yes. <laughs> I need this. But we're trying, you, Samantha, I feel like you need to be attached to this project if it ever happens. I, I mean, I you, need your this. heart is in I'm it. I'm so exploding. <laughs> like, this is what I needed today. The feel good, but oh, like heart wrenching uh, tale of coming through all the trials and tribulations and then coming to the end with her massive property, happily with holding hands with her husband, mm. loving life. It makes me so happy. And I just got to say, like, you know, Trans people like Lynn Conway deserve to live full, beautiful lives that account for their contributions and their brilliance. And they they deserve that regardless of where they are on their journeys. You know, transition, like, obviously this story was very fo- focused around uh, Conway's transition, but transition means different things to different people. Like, it can mean personal and medical and legal steps or, like, telling someone's family and friends and coworkers or using a different name or new pronouns or dressing differently, or it can be different things for different people. And as we discussed earlier, you know, it can be really financially prohibitive for many. And so you know, regardless of whether or not trans folks are able to transition the way that uh, Conway did, they deserve to live full lives. Like, they deserve whatever their particular version of a 24-acre farm on the woodlands in rural Michigan is. Like, they deserve that whether they can transition the way that she did or not. And so... You know, I, I just want to say that because I I think that sometimes it can feel like the reason why her story gets a happy ending is because she was able to transition. And I think that everybody deserves a full life and a happy ending, regardless of where they are on that journey. I mean, that's the end goal is let people live their best life to truly have the freedom and the peace and, and, and a happy a pursuit of happiness as they should, because this is about them. It's not about us. When people are disenfranchised and pushed to the point of, being non-existent, that's when we lose great minds, and that's when we lose greatness in general. And I, I, it breaks my heart, obviously, um, as as you have brought the story to us, that this is a good ending. And I love that we can celebrate her while she's still here and give her the flowers that she deserves while she's still here. But at the same time, you know, we can't look past the fact that she had to go through this in the first place. And though she was able to get through it, and thank God, 
that she was she was able to. There are so many others who are pushed beyond those boundaries, and that we don't get to celebrate who they are um, because of hate and ignorance and the continued need to erase and completely um, censure these amazing people just for who they are, just for living. And it, we cannot be quiet and belittle. Um, the fact that this is an ongoing issue today and the many who have been killed, the many who have died by suicide, like all of these things are important that we keep talking about what great success can look like, but the fact that that she shouldn't have have gone through half the that she had to go through and half the that many of these people have to go through. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why her story sticks with me because it just reminds me to sell, to like, build the monuments to these marginalized people who are so often erased and do so as a way to honor the people who didn't make it, the people whose voices and whose stories we won't hear, the people who are making contributions that we don't know about right now, right, that we won't find out about. And so, you know, I I think it's so important that we, just like you said, that we don't let sexist, racist, transphobic systems erase these accomplishments because they are important to all of us. There, there are history, as, as, just as people, as humans. And so it, it's, you really said it, like, it's so important to me. And it, Conway has this great piece kind of looking back on her life in the Huffington Post, and it ends with this great line, bottom line, if you want to change the future, start living as if you're already there. And I love that for her. I love the idea of all of us taking responsibility to sort of create the world we want to see and build these these monuments to these marginalized voices that we desperately need. So Lynn Conway, you are a hero. You are incredible. Your story is amazing. You are a badass. And I'm so glad that we can talk about her while she's still alive. Like we could go tweet at her if we wanted. Like that's incredible. That is living history. That is. We can tweet at her from the technology she helped create. (laughs) Oh, that got me really excited. <laughs> um, and thank you, Bridget, for bringing this story, for always, you know, finding these these things that we might have missed that are so important and are so, so valuable for us to know and talk about. Um, so we really appreciate it. And thank yes, you, thank, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you for giving me the space to do it. This is my favorite thing to do in the world. It makes me so happy. So thank, thanks to the both of you. Yes. Um, well, we can't wait to do it again. We'll see what we can get moving with this motion picture deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, Bridget, where can the good listeners find you? You can find me at my own podcast called There Are No Girls on the Internet, where we love digging into the unexplored, overlooked history of marginalized folks and how they shape technology and the internet. You can find me on Instagram at Bridget Marie in DC and on Twitter, probably tweeting at Lynn Conway how much I love her yes. at Bridget Marie. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. Definitely go check all that stuff out, listeners, if you haven't already. Thank you again, Bridget. Oh, Can't yes. wait to hang out again in this virtual, weird pandemic setting. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you listeners for listening. If you want to contact us, you can. Our email is stuffydmomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast or on Instagram at Stuff I Never Told You. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 